Arizona Wilder, who spoke for us last August in one of our very first public speaking engagements, gave us part of the story of her life. The title that we, I've given to it, or, or uh, I felt was appropriate, but she can change it if she wishes, is Bizarre Experiences of a Mind Control Slave. We're all, exper we're all familiar at least somewhat with the mind control area, the mind control program, but not nearly into some of the absolutely unthinkable experiences that people go through. Give her a r nice warm round of applause and welcome her back again to give us additional information on what she has learned, what she can now share with us that she didn't last year. Here comes Arizona. Hello. Uh, can everyone hear me? No? Now can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dean, for having me back uh, again this time at Global. Um, last time that I spoke here to the general audience, um, I simply went through and told people why I was doing what I was doing, what had happened to me. Um, and what I have to say about that at this time uh, is that there were a lot of other things that happened uh, besides rituals. Uh, there, were, there was programming at bases. Uh, they used military bases um, because they won't have any interference uh, when they have someone on a military base. And a lot of my programming took place on military bases. And I would like to talk about that. Uh, I would like to talk about the fact that there are rituals done at the military bases also, and that rituals are not a cover for mind control programming, as some survivors have been saying publicly lately. The people that do the mind control are involved and very rituals are very much a part of how they do things. For example, naval intelligence members or people that are in naval intelligence are usually very involved with Ordo Templi Orientis. And that doesn't mean that everyone in naval intelligence is involved in that. But naval intelligence is responsible for a lot of overseeing of ritual activity in this country. And they are responsible for a lot of this going on. There are other organizations, other um, agencies involved, but naval intelligence is very involved. Uh, I would like to show some slides today of my artwork depicting what was happening, some of what was happening to me. And this artwork is, it was done in crayon, pencil, pen, paint, whatever I ha could have my hands on at the time. It was done while sitting on the floor, it was done while being in the hospital, it was done while a anywhere that I could do it. And I did it as quickly as I could because these things that were coming out of me were overwhelming and I couldn't write about it. I did keep a lot of, of journals, but some things I couldn't write about, but I could draw. So I drew them. And there, there's a lot to be said for the drawings because there's something that can say what words can't say. It wouldn't, it wouldn't do it justice to try and describe in words what the pictures can show. Um, 
I also, before we start, I, I would like to uh, make a point about something. I'm not, um, I'm not usually a speaker. Um, I work full time, and I have a, a very busy life. Um, and this is coming here and doing this. This is the second time I've spoken to a, a larger audience. Um, I've been asked, why don't you write a book? I, I'm not particularly um, driven to write a book. Um, there's a lot of complexities in, regarding my feelings right now that I am still trying to deal with. Um, and I am doing this right now. I'm speaking out because of my children having been taken away from me. And this, I'm not the only one. So I think, I feel, uh, I feel that other survivors have lost their children in the same way because this is one of the first things that they do. And this is why I'm speaking out. I'm definitely not doing it for the money. This is not something that I would want to be known for. So, I think that it speaks for itself, and I'm telling you right now, this is a serious thing. It's not a game for me. Uh, it's, it's, if anyone in the audience feels like they can't watch some of these things, then they're free to leave. Um, and I won't, I'm not offended by it. But I'm just letting you know right now that I've had some reactions to these pictures, but I've picked out the tame ones. So, um, why don't we start? Okay, this first one is an example. Um, this is how I felt as a child, and this is how I felt most of my life. This was a picture. Uh, that I just drew to express how my mundane life felt. Um, I had no life to speak of. I had a lot of missing time. I couldn't figure out my feelings. I couldn't figure out anything. And this was about the first picture I ever did uh, dealing with uh, what was coming up. Okay, this picture is important simply because of the few pictures that follow. Uh, I had um, a part called Alice. And it turned out that it was Alice in the Gray Place. Alice in the Gray Place mystified me because I knew about Alice in Wonderland programming. But I didn't know what Alice in the Gray Place meant. And I had a lot of journaling to figure this one out and drawing. So this, it took a few years to figure this one out. Okay, the next thing that I realized that was coming up with this for some reason were dolphins. And uh, a lot of survivors have spoken about uh, dolphins in their experience and being taught to communicate with dolphins. And this was done on military bases. And this is what happened to me also, that this was coming from a military base. And I still hadn't put it together. So I knew that there were dolphins. I knew that they were gray. And in that way, I realized that there was a connection to Alice. Okay, what I realized and what I've discovered over the years is this is in particular pertains to Area 51. At Area 51, there are a lot of dealings with alien extraterrestrial life. 
and also on Area 51, extraterrestrial life, and also on Area 51 on this base, which is underground. It's extensive underground system and levels, about 14 levels. They not only deal with extraterrestrials, but in order to hide what they are doing and hide the fact that we have a very advanced technology that they are, there are a lot of these craft flying saucers that they, that they are actually engineering and putting out. We have that much of an advanced technology. It is not coming, all of it, from aliens. But it settles or it suits them just fine for us to think that it's all alien technology. We have the technology and we've had it for a long time. And it's far more advanced than you realize. The grays that I saw there on the base were under human control. The reason that they were under human control is because they were manufactured. They were called cybers, P-S-I-B-E-R-S. -E That's what they were referred to as cybers. And the cybers were manufactured with the help of genetic material from dolphins. They have the ability to communicate at a psychic level with other subjects because dolphins are renowned and known for having this ability due to scalar waves. That is what the cybers have. They are now, since being manufactured, they are cloned out. They're under control of human beings. They're not always perfect in what they do or how they perform. They are able to be in the spacecraft. I believe that it has been the experience of a number of abductees or a number of people that have come in contact with greys, that these are the greys that they're coming in contact with. And I saw them there. Something else that I've seen in the underground bases are a lot of, of experimentation using different animals, uh, using different alien life form, and using human beings trying to manufacture something that is pretty mutated. Um, and a lot of what I saw there did not live very long because they were failure experiments. And when, due to them not living very long, uh, they were experimented on. There were live vivisections being done. And there was no um, medication being used for pain. So one of the things that I did there since I was trained to have the psychic capabilities, and I'm not the only one that was used in this way, there were a lot of others used in this way, was to be there present while they were cutting up one of their mutations, um, a living creature, and trying to psychically prevent this creature or these creatures from feeling pain. So I was present during many of these um, vivisections and they are very, the whole thing is pretty horrific. But this was something else that again that goes on. It goes on there all the time. And I wasn't there to, to do that as, oh, well, I'm irreplaceable. I was there because it was enhancing my training. So it's like killing two birds with one stone. Something else that I, I would like to bring out is there were rituals going on at these bases. There were rituals that involved alien beings. 
and human beings, and it was going on there all the time. Um, I haven't really ever talked with any other survivors of this. Uh, I haven't heard anyone else talk about it. Uh, these are what I remember. This is an alien, this is an example of one that I saw there on the base. This was not a manufactured creature. This was an extraterrestrial on the base. Uh, these in particular were not very nice. Um, and they were usually accompanied by um, military. But these were something that I saw there. They didn't seem to like to be here either. Okay, now um, what I'm getting into, I would like to talk about our little exchange program with Russia. When I was five, um, some of the training that I had took place over in Russia. And we have a partnership with the Soviet Union, or with Russia now, uh, that has been around a long time. The whole time that uh, we had this supposed Cold War with Russia, we were learning from them or partners with them. Um, they really went, they were very advanced in their psychic training, psychic experimentation. There were some uh, places here that were associated with that. And one of those places that I was also involved with was over at UCLA. Uh, it was a parapsychology program that was run by Thelma Moss and Jolly West. And, excuse me, the uh, MK Ultra Labs are still over at UCLA. Um, their parapsychology program supposedly was shut down. I did run into um, someone in... Uh, the early 90s, who was telling me about some other things about it and that Barry Taft was running it at that point. Um, but I have a lot of memories about UCLA parapsychology unit there being involved with the psychic experimentation that was going on in Russia. This particular picture deals with what I saw there. This, this was a uniformed KGB officer that was taking something or standing there while a, one scientist was talking to another. And from my memories, this was taking place in Leningrad. This was a picture that I did I had a, a really violent, terrible memory about being um, drowned in ice water, purposely there. What was happening was that they were using ice water, and the water was very important in this, to cause near-death experiences. And that I know of, this happened to me three times before I could complete the experiment or the assignment that was given to me. And the assignment for me was to go out of my body and in my astral body go to another room, a specified room, and go in there and pick up a pencil sitting on the table and make a mark on the piece of paper. There was a KGB officer present sitting there at the table it was being recorded on a camera, and it took me three tries to get this right. 
And it was very interesting because uh, at one point I was in therapy with a therapist who was internationally. And it was very interesting because uh, at one point I was in therapy with a therapist who was internationally known for working in this area with people that have been ritually abused and mind controlled. And he told me that he'd had three other clients that reported this same kind of experimentation. I hadn't really spoken to anyone about my memories, so I found this very interesting. This is another example of the kind of thing that happens on bases that I went through and many others have gone through. I had nothing in my life to uh, compare this with. I didn't pull it up from anywhere. I didn't see any books. There are no books dealing with this. Now maybe some people are writing some. There's nothing to compare this to. There were no TV shows that dealt with this. And there's just nowhere that I could have pulled this up from. This was a very hard, these were very hard pictures to draw because I had to deal with everything when I was drawing these. This is a picture that I did for the therapist. It was dealing with my feelings about all of this. Um, none of these pictures, I might add, are done after 1995. Um, parts of them you can't see. I dated every single one of them, but you cannot see the exact dates on these, unfortunately. There was a lot of it, there was a lot of programming that was being done with strobe lighting with being hooked up to EEG machinery, EEG biofeedback. Um, there was a lot of electrodes placed on other part of parts of the body recording nerve impulses. Um, there were drugs that were being given. Um, there were earphones uh, so that you were hearing different tones, different sounds. And there was a type of a device placed on the head that, along with that, where you actually heard it through your mastoid bones in your head. And this is an example of what came out that had been done to the inside of me. It's how, it is how a, um, system is being set up and it's very interesting because uh, at the time I did not know what tritones were. I didn't know if it was anything at all but I had, this is what they were using, they were using tritones to program and tritones are two specific notes that when they are played together produce a third sound which will alter your brainwave activity. And there are a lot of different variations on the tritones that can cause you a lot of pain or they can cause you to feel very good. But this was part and parcel what they were using with the programming. And this was a picture that I had drawn of how they were what I call gridding the brain. And they gridded the brain in order to have control over the different parts of the brain. And they were, what they were going to do was stimulate some part of your brain and cause you to react in a situation without knowing why you did it. Or you don't remember what you said, what you did. 
uh, or you, you're carrying out preset commands. And that is what gritting is about. Okay, now this I included because what they were also programming in at these bases, this was an example of not just Greek letters, which were used in programming, but Oum alphabet. And Oum is used in the cult. And it is Druidic. This was being done on the bases. And a lot of it was learning how through stimulation to uh, use your fingers because fingers and hands are used in communicating OM. And this is responsible for what has been, it's part of what is called hand signaling. And different people have talked about being hand signaled. OM is used for that purpose. So they were doing these ritual things there. And I unfortunately you can't see the writing at the bottom. But it's hard to see it. Down here, down there it says, uh, I have no age, I span the ages. And this was something that came out in 1989. It was the start of some of these drawings. Um, this was a part of me that I called Keeper. And he was the keeper of the flame. And the flame being Illuminati flame. And this was a part of me that kept a lot of occult knowledge. And this was something created on a base. It was created on in a military base. It was created at China Lake Naval Weapons Station. So then these others started coming out. I'd never seen any occult material that I know of. I've never read books. Um, I'd never seen anything near, even near it on TV. This was another one dealing with um, deity Astroth. And I didn't know anyone else that was even drawing anything like this. And Astroth is an ancient deity. It goes back to Babylon. And you note that the eyes are blue, but the pupils are slit. I have this in a lot of the drawings. Uh, and there is blood on this one because she, this one it consumes human blood. This was another one that I can't, um, it didn't go all the way in the frames. Originally it was backwards. It was written backwards. And it was, re it was about the Great Earth Mother. And I had never heard of it when it came up. When it came up in my memory, I never heard of the Great Earth Mother. I didn't know what the Great Earth Mother was. I didn't uh, travel with people that that were that talked like that. I mean, you don't have to be a cult to talk about the Great Earth Mother or the Mother as the Great you know, the Earth as the Great Mother. I just had never heard of it. So I. When these came out, it was, it was um, at the time I didn't know what it was. What I understand it to be now, um, there is a Vesica Pisces there, which is very important. It represents creation. It represents uh, creation from the cosmos. And this represents the Earth Mother and the moon that, that travels around the Earth 13 times in a year. So this has to do with that. Again, created on a military base. Not because it's a cover. This was another one that came up. And my understanding is that Lou is Druidic. My understanding about the other words 
are that they are they go back to Sumerian they have Sumerian roots okay okay this was another one that came out it was about the child and the mother and the crone the triple goddess uh, again via our wonderful military bases that apparently do just mind control for governmental things. Okay. Um, what I wanted what I want to just make a point about right now is that I had drawings I'm not ready to deal with yet that I didn't bring here because I still have a hard time with them and one of them involves a, something I did I don't even know why it got saved um, I did as a child uh, I was in second grade it is a drawing of a dragon I'm not I don't feel like I have to prove that I drew it, but I did draw it. And what I've been challenged about a lot is that, well, these are holographic images. They don't exist. They're all in the mind. They're fairy tales. They're not real. And I have had to hear that a lot. Since I've seen also reptilians on the military bases, so besides seeing them in rituals off bases and rituals on bases, uh, I wanted to try and find some evidence that they were, there were pictures that were recorded before. This happens to be 6,000 year old figurines that were discovered at Acumbero, Mexico. And these are women that are playing with little dragons. And what is interesting about this is that I had told David Icke in an interview that in the dungeon of this castle in Alsace-Lorraine where Pindar lives, or sometimes is that, that there were dragons in the basement, little ones that were considered pets. And I found this, and I'm sure that this is not the only example, but I, these things do exist, and they, are, they can be seen in other places, and they can be seen today. Okay, this one is Phoenician. It's Archangel Michael who was Tazmikikal, who is battling the dragon. And the wings, I mean, this one was later to become Archangel Michael. The wings are down on the legs, right there. And then the fire is between them, and that has become the Illuminati flame. But that was a symbol for fire. The Phoenicians knew of the dragons, they knew of the reptilians, and their work depicted them quite a lot. Okay, this one is another one. The intercessor, who is a priest, that guy right there, is pleading to Indara, who became St. Michael, that guy right there, for the life of the man about to be sacrificed to the dragon, that one right there. And the symbol above the man signifies death, and the goat signifies the solar deity. Again, Illuminati symbolism. Okay.
Okay, this one I have to show you has been known as a Phoenician symbol. It is an early form of the swastika. What it is, is that the dragon became a serpent. The same serpent in the Bible, in Genesis, to disguise the fact that it was actually a dragon. So that the enemy is a snake or Satan. Um, and this was a, this started occurring with the Phoenicians and it started because that's, by that time, the shape, or the reptilians had come there to be with the Phoenicians and so-called save them. And this started being covered up then. And pleading with your life, or pleading with, for someone's life, for a dragon, you know, to, for the dragon not to eat them or kill them, became St. George battling the dragon. And it's become wound up in all kinds of stories. It's, it's come into the Arthur legends, the Grail legends. The, it, it's us against them. We're all one. It's us against them. And the dragons are mythical. The dragons are not mythical. And they hide the fact that they are here. So, the point that I'm trying to make today is that the military bases are used as a lot more than just simply military bases. They're doing quite a trade with, with innocent people. And they are involved in the occultic activity. They also are all connected underground. And that is how a lot of people get from one place to another without anyone ever knowing it. They're also involved with ritualistic activity. And they are not instilled memories either. They're definitely not. What is happening is that both things are true. People are seeing and experiencing rituals there not because it's being used as a cover. It is happening because the people themselves that are in charge are doing this kind of activity. And the rituals happening in Area 51 are being done also because the, there are alien life, there is alien life there that are, they are also tend to be ritualistic themselves. There are reptilians on the base at Area 51. I am sure that some people have seen them there. Um, it would be impossible not to if you were able to be at the right place in the right time and be able to watch. Um, and it is occurring on other bases also. I'm going to show you one last picture because I do have something to say about the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, this is a picture of a um, ritual uh, portraying the, the carrying around of the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia. And this, is, I understand, is done every year. What I have known, and there are some others that know also, that the Ark, the true Ark, is not in Ethiopia. It never was in Ethiopia. It's at a place in Egypt. No, it's not the Great Pyramids. Um, it's a place that have been that's been used in the past. It was it was a temple that was erected to perform rituals and it's associated with Illuminati. And the Ark is there. Uh, I have a friend who has told me about these same rituals uh, being held in Japan. Uh, I have a friend who has told me 
about these same rituals uh, being held in Japan and that they have the Ark there and it is associated with the Emperor of Japan and that there are stone circles there and that there are there seems to be an association with the Phoenicians that is my understanding um, it's very interesting that this same symbology uh, same story is also over in Japan with the Ark uh, Japan plays a very important part in this whole thing with the Illuminati and they have downplayed it it's been kept very quiet over here in the United States um, I had when I was involved with them the Illuminati and very mind controlled by them been to Japan a few times and dealing with being around the Emperor at the time who was, and uh, forgive me if I am not pronouncing this correctly, but Akihito um, and they are very much also a part of the Illuminati and they're very important right now at this time period they hold a very important key to what is going to happen and I'm going I will talk about that in workshop um, if anyone had questions about that I am Brian and myself will both talk about it in the workshop they also hold the key to Atlantis um, at this point in time I, I've been asked here a lot and I think that I'll address this I have been asked why why are you still alive and uh, why aren't they doing anything to you what, what do you think they have planned for you and what I believe is because the harassment pretty much stopped a couple of years ago I believe I've gotten to the point to where they can't there's not much more they can do um, I still would expect anything but I have been very busy just trying to put my life back together in a, in a normal sense um, I still sometimes talk to survivors on the phone I have people call me and I don't feel that I'm very helpful to them because the problems are, are huge and myriad and I can't help them over the phone um, it's very complex but I, I I still now I keep up on reading about these places uh, I put a lot of my memory work aside for right now and I hope to take it up again someday but uh, right now it's just watching all of this watching the way the programming has changed the programming is very um, very complex now it's very sophisticated they no longer need to use programmers in the same way that they did when I was young there seems to be a lot of association with military bases from people that I've heard uh, talked to there seems to be a lot of association with alien activity some of it I believe is a screen some of it is not there are a lot of people that have talked about being involved in rituals but I think that a lot of people from what I see have a hard time with oh well there were rituals and oh well there's alien activity and oh well there are military bases so it's something that is not I haven't come to a conclusion myself I know what I was involved in I'm still listening to other people and what they're involved in but I'm I'm really very busy right now so I don't have much time 
as I did before. Um, they use residences in neighborhoods. It's not always a military basis. They use residence for upkeep and maintenance of people. Um, at this point, I think I've said about all I have to say on the subject for now. So if anyone has any questions, I'm willing to take them. I should say that we have you line up to the microphone over on the side and state your name and your question. I am Scott. I talked to you yesterday. I used to work with people like you before I had visions of heaven. Um, it's really touching to hear your story. There was a book written about what you went through, and it was written over 50 years ago by C.S. Lewis. It's called um, That Hideous Strength. I was wondering if you'd studied that or ever heard of it or read it. I have never read any of C.S. Lewis's books. Um, I had my reading kind of set by my parents as to what I could read. Yeah. What's, and, what's so encouraging I felt about the book is when I take people to heaven and they get interested and it starts really taking off, I pretty much make that required reading for them because it teaches both sides of the issue. It teaches the evil, it, it talks about the vivisections, it talks about the, uh, um, the mind control, it talks about all that stuff, but it talks about the positive very strongly and how that all will be overcome in the long, in the long run. It's, very, it's a very beautiful, encouraging book to read. And that's why I wanted to bring it to your attention. It might be very good for you to read as well. It's just a beautiful book. Thank you. Yeah, I will, I will have to look into that. Uh, one thing I will say is that a lot of people, when I speak, they think that I, I might come across as sad. Well, I'm sad because this whole thing is tragic. It's very tragic. And that I might come across as, gee, there's nothing I can do. Well, there, in a way, there is nothing that I can do other than what I am doing. I feel I'm doing the most powerful thing that I can do. And it takes a lot of courage for me to do it. Thank you for taking my question. <clears throat> I have been called and uh, asked to interview a lady who has talked to me about the very same things you're discussing. And I noticed in her and I noticed in you the same thing, that, that your speech is, is very much um, educated. Your, your choosing of words, the way that you uh, say things. I would like to uh, have an opportunity to talk to you in depth at another time, if that's possible. But my question is, both of, of you and her, when I get the opportunity uh, to interview her, is these things have happened to you, and we all feel that, that you're telling the truth and that these things do exist. We don't see them, we don't experience them on a day-to-day -day basis. How, when you come into this society again as, as living a normal life as much as you can, how do you see the average person being able to stop this kind of thing, help you rehabilitate, and keep our children from having this kind of thing take place? The way that I think that people can fight this is since we're all attacked on every level and all, we're all programmed to some degree. We're programmed in different ways. It's the system that's doing it. We're set up to do that. We're all programmed to some degree. We're programmed in different ways. It's the system that's doing it. We're set up to do that. Uh, for example, is if you are a school teacher and you see what is happening in the school system, that you fight this on every level, that you, you protest, you, you go and you let them know, this is not right. You, 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 can have, you can make data yourself. You can, you know, you have children every year. For example, 
if they're not learning this, they're not learning that, gee, this is what teaching them this or that is doing to them. And you can you have a voice and you can use it. This also stands true for nurses, police, doctors, lawyers. It stands true for factory workers. There is injustice in every part of the system. It was made to be that way. And as long as we don't speak out, it will go on. And there is programming in that way for everybody. But if you are aware of it, then you have an obligation to do something about it. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Sine, uh, for trauma-based mind control as they use with you when you were younger, is that still being uh, done with uh, the non-enlightened ones, so to speak, or they have they got some new technology now that they're using uh, to program in a much quicker way? My understanding is that the, the programming is much, much more sophisticated. They don't need to use a programmer to methodically terrorize and abuse and, and torture the way that they used to. They have the computers to do it now. They have a kind of a, I don't know, interactive bio type computer that you just hook someone up to and that computer can take care of the whole thing. And it senses pain, it senses the level of the pain reaction, it senses the terror, it does everything that a human programmer could do. And it's doing very well um, because the incidence of obvious mind control victims coming into uh, psychiatric facilities is not the same as it was 10 years ago, and I think there are two reasons for that. One reason is that they saw where the holes in the programming were when people started coming into it about 15 years ago, and they corrected their mistakes. The other reason is that a lot of the therapists and psychiatrists in the psychiatric field refuse to deal with it anymore, partly because they are being harassed. They've been harassed right out of business. They've been harassed right out of dealing with it. They've been threatened, and I know this for a fact because it happened to people that saw me, not just because they saw me, but because they were dealing with it. And the other thing, the other reason is that there is a big movement that is backed by the FMS um, who is funded by human ecology, which is part of that CIA backed. They are really pushing to have this not dealt with, to have, you know, they're saying that it's very rare to see something like this. And some of these doctors are contracted by different agencies such as CIA. So all of this is happening and they're trying to cover up. But the programming has become highly sophisticated. Uh, Arizona, one of the question in the aspect of the altars that they lay down uh, either before or presently with a computer, is there a religious altar laid down which gives them a script what heaven looks like and the different people in heaven and that sort of thing that uh, would be consistent in many mind control people? Um, what I know, I can, I can tell you from what I know about myself that there was religious programming laid down and that one of the favorite NSA things to do is to say that your programmer is God and that the contact is through the Holy Spirit. And this creates a lot of havoc. Um, there was a lot of religious programming done on me. Now, I know some people that had more than I did, but I did experience that. And it's quite a trick to get through it. Is there a uniformity among many of their thinking is in relation to their characters that they would see or people they would know there 
It could be the same programming that has been given to many. Uh, what I what I think is that they will find something in in the child's life because it's going to start when they're a child, and use that. And the background for me was that I was Catholic, so there was a lot pertaining to Catholicism. Arizona, could you uh, do you know if there was any type of NASA involvement? Can could you speak on that? NAS. NASA. I'm NASA. NASA. N A S A. Oh, NASA? Involvement. In my case, or in, I, I know that I've heard other survivors speak on it, and by the way, I only have about 30 seconds, so it has to be the last question. Um, NASA involvement, I've had some memory myself of involvement, but not much. Uh, I don't really know that I had much to do with NASA. I've heard other people extensively talk about it, and they were probably used extensively in correlation to that, since I also understand that Jack Parsons, was, who founded the Jet Propulsion Labs in Pasadena, was very into the occult and Aleister Crowley, so I wouldn't doubt it. But I, I have to wrap it up now, because my time is up. I really appreciate you all listening, uh, and thank you very much. Do you think you'd have the courage to do this sort of thing? Thank you very much, and we appreciate you doing it and trying to bring us the truth. That reminds me that uh, then between now and the next time you come back in about five or six minutes, we will distribute on your